Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eric Lenask. I'm with TMC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's live webinar. Uh, you know, these are kind of the only live events that we can experience these days. Uh, today's event is called How UMA's Private Label UCAS Solution Increases Partner Margins and Adds Value to Customers. So, you know, as we're all here taking part in this webinar, you know, if, if you think about for a minute how this COVID-19 pandemic has really changed how most of us are working, we're not in our offices. We're all working from our homes. And for some of us, it's not much of a departure from the norm, though having our families home with us may be. But for others, this whole teleworking thing, it's a brand new concept. It's something they've never done, and especially for the millions of companies that have been forced to suddenly adopt new teleworking strategies and technologies. It's been a challenge. You know, for you and for us in the tech space, UCAS is not a new conversation. But for those millions of companies that hadn't previously started thinking about adopting cloud-based solutions and developing cloud strategies, this situation really is shining a bright spotlight on UCAS, those kinds of solutions that are enabling all those businesses to remain productive despite this pandemic that's going on. No, but there are still a huge number of businesses that have kind of been piecing together their remote working capabilities um, using free conferencing services that may be available, call forwarding from their office lines to their cell phones and, and those sorts of things. You know, and those may work as a temporary fix while you get other things in place. You know, it's really not the most effective way to run a business and, and to manage a remote workforce effectively. You really need a complete solution. So ultimately, while this pandemic, you know, we know it's been devastating for so many businesses and individuals, you know, in the tech space, I think there's a silver lining here as the world is seeing the value of the cloud and of other modern technologies that they may have brushed aside previously. You know, for service providers and their partners, it's creating an opportunity to present those solutions that can help those businesses out. And not only today during this unprecedented scenario, but as we look forward into the future, giving them the ability to support remote and mobile workers in an involving scenario. You know, and of course, on the business side, it's an opportunity for providers to increase re customer relationships and to build monthly recurring revenue streams. You know, the truth is, it's a trend that's been here for a while. The demands of new workforce dynamics and, and what they've done and meant to businesses in terms of implementing flexible communication solutions has been ongoing. It's just, that, it's just that this coronavirus crisis has kicked it into high gear. You know, the question then becomes, as an MSP, a VAR, consultant, distributor, integrator, whatever your sales model may really be, how can you take advantage of this increased focus on UCAS? How can you make sure you're offering the best solutions to your customers and that you're generating maximum revenue opportunities for your company? Well, that's really the kind of thing that Brad Nichols is here to talk about. Brad is the Senior Manager of Private Label Sales at UMA and has been in the telecom space for more than 15 years, having held a number of different roles at companies that really have excelled at selling through the channel. You know, for the next half hour or so, Brad's going to share his expertise, the information and the knowledge that he's gained from working with those channel-focused communications providers and now with UMA. And in particular, he's looking forward to showing you why a private label relationship may be an optimal path to your growth as a partner and why UMA's private label program uh, delivers so many benefits to partners. But before I hand over today's session to Brad, just a couple of quick programming notes for you. Um, you've all got an interface on your screens to ask questions and I encourage you to use that feature at any time. We'll get to your questions during the Q&A period that we've left at the end of today's session. And uh, we also have two poll questions during, during today's uh, session. Uh, hopefully they'll help Brad better understand he, how you, our audience, is positioned in, in today's environment so he can better help address your needs with his commentary. So thanks in advance for taking just a moment to help us out with those answers. And uh, with that said, actually, why don't we jump right into the first poll question. Um, we're looking to hear from you. Uh, what's 
the most important factor when you're evaluating cloud VoIP providers. Service, support, implementation, features, or something other than those. Um, you know, Brad, welcome. Great to have you on board with us today. Uh, you know, Thank so you. as 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 our audience uh, answers this question, you know, I look at these and how do you really pick which one of these is most important? You know, if if I'm looking at different providers, you know, I want all of those. Sure. Yeah, it's a good point. And uh, thank you for the intro. Um, and thank you to TMC as well for uh, for hosting us. Uh, we, we look forward to uh, you know, providing some value within this uh, this presentation. But that's a good point you bring up. Um, uh, are you looking for all four of those? Sure. But sometimes as you're talking to prospects or partners, um, they have certainly, you know, given uh, maybe past experiences or um, uh, you know what they're hearing, you know, from talking to other colleagues throughout the industry. Uh, one of those things could certainly, uh, you know, be more important to them, uh, if given, um, you know, some feedback they've gotten, or again, you know, past, you know, good or bad experiences that, that they've had. So uh, I always like to break it down when, you know, and when you have these conversations with uh, some great partners that I've talked to over the years, everybody's a little bit of a different mindset, a different view. Of course, all four of those things are important, but um, I think as we'll see from maybe from some of the answers that, you know, we'll, we'll see how different partners can think, you know, one from another. And not to say they're right or wrong, uh, it's just more me trying to understand, um, you know, how partners are looking uh, at service providers today uh, to make sure that we're hitting the mark, making sure that we understand what's important to them. Of course, Brad, um, let's... Let's take a look at what, uh, what the folks in our audience are telling us. And, um, you know, there's a reasonably equal distribution across uh, all four of those. Seems pretty even right there. Yeah, as I'm looking at the, the numbers right here, service. And it's funny that, you know, service uh, comes out on top, you know, which would, what people think would be the easiest delivering one call to another. Uh, sometimes can be the most difficult depending on, um, you know, networks and how certain service providers are set up or where their focus is really. Um, you know, some uh, companies really focus on customer support and service, you know, maybe have a, a more bare bones features to offer, um, but understanding how their customers use phone systems, you know, really helps them uh, build the right solution and focus, uh, you know, in terms of providing good service, you know, support, implementations, features. But um, it's it's not not providing that service wins because when service is not good, well, everybody on this call, including myself, is, is having a tough day. So um, whereas support and implementations can certainly cause uh, issues as well, service is a, a really fast way to, you know, to ruin someone's day. So. No doubt, no doubt about that, Brad. And um, with that, I'm going to let you take it away. Great. Thank you again for the intro. And uh, thank you for everyone for uh, for letting us uh, hop on here. Hope everybody's staying safe out there uh, with what's going on. And uh, hopefully the worst is behind us. And uh, within a month or so, we can start getting back to work. With that said, um, uh, we bring up some good points in terms of you know where this workforce management is going, uh, remote workforce management. Uh, and really what we're focusing on today is the, you know, the different ways that you can go to market, you know, uh, in terms of what types of partner programs uh, maybe you're currently in today. Uh, and, uh, and there's some other options out there that, you know, we can explore. Uh, as I always tell people, it's not my job to sell people into becoming a channel partner or becoming a, a private label slash white label partner. Uh, it's, it's really simply... Uh, an education process and, and, and showing you what it looks like and, and bringing you through uh, the entire sales process. And I always tell people, take advantage of our sales process because it's an education process, especially on the private label side. You know, traditional, um, you know, channel programs, agent programs, uh, I think are, you know, pretty much uh, they're, they're very defined in terms of it's not, there's not a lot of moving pieces. But when you talk about, you know, white label programs and private label programs, uh, there are a lot of moving pieces. There are different types of programs there's reseller programs so you know what i wanted to do today was really you know paint the picture uh, um, of uma and who we are uh, as we are somewhat uh, new to the channel and somewhat new to the private label and white label community and i'm just going to say private label moving forward private label and white label to me are you know very they're, they're considered the same thing on today's call although you know from an industry definition they're maybe a little bit different but just for everybody uh, so everybody knows on the call 
Um, and yes, back to my point about UMA, you know, it's very rare that you work for a publicly traded company, you know, on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, when you're talking to, you know, partners that I've dealt with over the years um, and having done this for almost 15 years now, longer than I want to admit, uh, it's very rare that uh, those types of, um, you know, partners have never heard of the, the publicly traded company that you work for. But in, you know, in this instance, I, I do understand why is that, you know, UMA was really born in uh, the residential space in 2003. Um, that's where we, you know, kind of made our made some noise, uh, you know, back in the day. But we shifted uh, towards B2B sales uh, probably around 2008 or nine. So we do have a, you know, a lot of years, you know, selling in the in the business space. But we've we've done it direct, and basically UMA uh, Direct is uh, based out of Sunnyvale, California. Uh, and that's where the majority of our employees are, and that is where all the direct employees are. And and they have a different philosophy in terms of how they go about um, finding direct um, customers. And that's you know they knock on doors every day. It's a very old school mentality, uh, and it's very different than obviously where you know where I come from through the channel. Uh, so we've evolved a lot over the years. We you know. Uh, be, went IPO in 2015, uh, and really this company is built on cloud communications, whether it was through residential or the B2B side, uh, now private label and channel, is that you know we were, we were one of the first cloud communication companies out there, but again, our go-to-market strategy was a little bit different versus the other ones that maybe you've heard of. We have over a million users, a million plus users, which is a, a large uh, number for sure in terms of endpoints, volume, traffic, uh, we pass a lot of traffic through our network, uh, and it is, um, you know, really helps in terms of, you know, helping get costs down for private label programs to to benefit our partners. And you know, on the on the uh, business B two B side growth over the last five quarters, you know, we've seen a 50% growth, and it doesn't look like we're we're slowing down you know all that much this quarter with what's going on. Uh, and the reason is is because we sell a technology that, well, it's 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 important right now for people, uh, and I think we all, everybody on this call, if you're you know involved in the unified communications or hosted voice over IP industry, you know, you know we're all in this together in terms of providing a service that's really important uh, to customers uh, and really important you know in terms of remote workforce. It's right now becoming the lifeblood of some people's companies and making sure that those companies, uh, you know, are, are thriving through these tough times and can come out the other end, you know, and still you know be profitable so we have to keep people working and then we launched private label i would say in 2018 uh, and <clears throat> really have you know in terms of the channel pro program and the, and the private label program we're really starting to to see the, you know the the hard work that we put in to, you know starting to pay off now uh, we're about 600 plus employees maybe a little bit closer to 700 again based out of california so you know we are a very big company but you know, we silo off our company to where it feels like a small company, which is one of the reasons, uh, you know, I really took a hard look in terms of coming over to UMA and, you know, one of the tipping points and why I came over here was the way that they treat their customers, the way that they go about implementations is that they build products around, you know, some of the, you know, the pitfalls throughout the industry, making that easier, removing the friction for your customers, as people would say, uh, to provide that frictionless experience for your customers. It makes partners, uh, you know, much, uh, it, it makes partners day to day their job much easier, uh, makes customers much happier, uh, and it gives us the ability um, you know, to focus on, you know, improving technology because the stability and the implementation and providing the service from A to B is always going to be there. I think that's something that separates us from the competition. And this is just a direct reflection in terms of what that looks like is you know, PC Magazine has voted us, uh, you know, the top VoIP provider seven years running. <laughs> um, and when you it's not surprising based on terms of how you know again we built the technology but we're also have the you know the highest net promoter score of 50 of any UCAS provider or at least one of the highest that might be the highest right now and, and for, for those, those of you who don't know what net promoter score is MPS score it's how referenceable you are as a company you know your customers rate you on one to ten you know one being the lowest ten being the highest uh, and it's a it's an industry standard now MPS score where companies like Southwest Airlines and Harley Davidson, American Express, a lot of huge companies across the country use this to measure um, their customer service, to measure how happy their customers are. And our customers are very happy. Our retention rate is very good. 
So as you can see, we sit atop of that list um, and that speaks volumes in terms of you know, the type of attention we give our customers, the type of technology that we build for our customers and, and understanding what our customers need from us in terms of providing the right technology. If you look at in terms of you know why customers are happy from a technical aspect, some of the things that we do, uh, we have tailored solutions. So what does that mean? I'm sure we all hear that a lot. A tailor-made solution for your business. Uh, and this aspect is that um, we have a few different voice solutions that we can offer, and we keep those two worlds very separate. Is that you know what's really important in understanding. Um, what customers need. It's it's a salesman that will kind of sit there and be quiet and listen to what they need, right? Asking the right questions is important, but if, you know, for those of you who I'm sure uh, have talked to a, a customer coming off a bad experience, it's pretty obvious what they need because they're they're very good at telling you that because of the, the bad experience they're going through. Uh, so they, they walk you through step by step, hey, this is, but for other customers maybe, you know, who, who, are, who are new to the, to, to, to cloud communications, who are new to uh, maybe telephony and, and trying to understand the ins and outs and with all the different providers out there. You know, these are the things that I think we hang our hat on and do very well. Uh, the best call quality, an outage rich company, you know, we're not going to affect service in any which ways. We're incredibly redundant. Um, and then in terms of, you know, you heard me mention the integrations. It's a, it's a basically a three-step process for some products and how that works. Uh, and then we have, you know, an enterprise product as well. Uh, so there's two, you know, underlying voice over IP products. One we use more for the enterprise side and one we use more for the SMB side. But that's not to say that either world doesn't, you know, overlap, you know. So we, we want to make sure we understand how the customer uses their phones today what they want to improve, what they're looking to possibly gain, and that will dictate ultimately the right solution in terms of what, you know, where we provide that and how we do it. As we shift gears now and talk about a little bit, you know, go to market strategies is that, you know, the word private label and white label, um, it certainly is, it keeps every year, I think, picking up momentum, right? Is that the channel is always going to be there and uh, God bless it. Why not? It's, it, it serves a, a great purpose for, for partners like you. Um, but there is other ways to skin the cat, as they say, right? There's other ways to go to market. Now, that's not to say that it's a fit for everybody. Uh, it certainly might not be, um, but it's worth exploring um, because, you know, what some of the things that our private label program does, you know, can do for our partners, uh, you know, of course, increase margin, any type of wholesale or private label program is really going to increase margins, you know, probably double, sometimes triple what you would make versus a channel program. I think the real value though, is owning your customer base. Um, is that if you're, you know, in a channel program today, uh, is that, the people who own that customer are the, are the service providers. Where in the in the private label and the white label world, uh, our private label and white label partners, private label partners own the customer. So they own, you know, they handle the billing. So if you think about, you know, why cloud communications really is kind of overtaking prem communications, it's one because cloud communications is much more flexible and scalable uh, as it evolves over the years. And now that bandwidth is a lot better, we can really compete uh, from a reliability standpoint. You know, I've started selling cloud communications in 2005, so I've seen a much different type of technology versus when I started. Um, but controlling your customer base and having a monthly recurring customer base you know, that's um, recurring really gives you more value when you go into to sell that customer base. And if you own it, then you can sell it. If you don't own it, it's tough to sell a base that you don't own. So you're, you know, you're building yourself a, a retirement nest egg, you know, in the, in the private label community uh, by owning your customers, you know, and you're also, you're selling your brand. It's, it's not the, you know, the UMA brand, it's not the ring central brand. It's not the eight by eight brand. It's, it's, it's your brand. And, you know, why do customers buy? from you. I always go back to, you know, the, the most basic fundamental uh, question of why customers buy and it's because they like you. They like your company. They like what you've built. They like your story that you have told time and time again. And you put a lot of, you know, sweat and hours into building your business. So what I always tell people is, you know, continue that journey, sell your brand. Don't be behind the scenes of another provider. If it fits your business needs and you can do this, then this is something that you should really look at. Uh, from a customer experience standpoint, you got to ask yourself, 
you know, who knows your customers better? Is it a company that you're referring customers to or is it your, or is it yours, right? Is that if they're already your customers and you're already working with them and there's different situations of whether you're a telecom broker or an MSP or an interconnect. So these variables might not apply to everybody, but for those who kind of, it, it does apply to, is that you know your customers much better than a service provider would. We're, we're trying to provide phone systems on top of a network, uh, maybe an existing MPLS network, you know, WAN, LAN, is that you understand that network better than we do. So it makes the experience uh, usually that we've seen it's a happier customer for the simple fact is that you're already working with them. You don't have to wait for, you know, you know, salesmen like me, right? Sometimes we can be a little bit slow. Sometimes, you know, end of quarters come up. Um, you know, sometimes people are just not responsive. Uh, there's there's a hundred variables in terms of, you know, why people do or do not get back to you. But you don't have to, the fact that you control your business, you control the technology, when you quote it, when you implement it, when you sell it, when you deliver it, uh, is that you, you're not going to be slowed down by anybody. And then most importantly is, as you're looking for a private label provider out there, is reliability is, a, is actually one of the, the major uh, issues, I would say, amongst the private label community uh, is, you know, how reliable is the network is that if you are going to sell your brand and you are going to sell your company, well, guess what has to be that much better? Of course, the reliability. And if it's not, then you're really, you know, uh, risking your brand at that point. And we recognize that over at UMA, right? And that's what we have built and invested so much money into our network, you know, into reinvesting our, you know, our revenue where we're growing 50% over the last five quarters. We could have easily taken that money, uh, you know, in, in terms of paying it out. And but what we've done is we've reinvested that technology into acquiring other companies, into building our our technology, building out our redundancy, uh, because that's what's important to us. That's the type of provider that we want to be known as. And I'll just kind of kick this off for uh, the second poll question here. This is a reminder for me because I'll forget in two seconds. But if you don't mind, let's uh, kick that off, and I'll jump to the next slide. Absolutely. Let's get. Uh get that out there for our audience. Um, you know, so Brad started talking a little bit about the, uh, you know, the private label strategy. Um, we're curious to know what your current go-to-market model is. Are you currently running white label? Are you considering going white label? Or uh, you're a channel partner or a sub-agent? Um, while, while we wait for our, for our audience to uh, take a moment to answer these, Brad, I, I want to get to, uh, you know, we got a good question in from our audience already. Um, about geography and where your, um, you know, in terms of what, what geographies your private label program is available in. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so uh, currently uh, we have data centers, and I, I do have this in a slide right here, but why not answer it now? I'll probably be a little repetitive, so bear with me. Uh, but we have uh, four data centers in North America. We have uh, two in Canada and two in the States. Uh, we also have a data center in UK. We have one in Japan, we have one in Australia. So we have a pretty good global presence. I would say that's probably 60-ish uh, percent of the world that we can cover. When I say cover, we can provide local dialing in those international countries. And that's really the key, is that a lot of companies can provide DIDs, but that's not local dialing. So, um, you know, if you go to a customer and say, hey, great, you have local DIDs, but every time you call across the street, it's going to traverse back to the States and be an international call. It's not very appealing to them. So, uh, we, you know, we solve that problem, you know, for a lot of the UK customers we have, Australia, Japan, and then that will be expanding as well. But, you know, we, we can cover a good part of the globe today. And thank you for that question. That's a great question. Awesome. Let's take a look at what our audience um, is doing right now. Sure. Um, and you can see that uh, overwhelmingly they're either considering a white label or um, uh, their channel partner or sub-agent. Yep. Almost. Look at that, neck and neck. So it looks like I got some work to do to convince some people, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you again for answering that, and we'll be, you know, digesting these polls as they come in a little bit more. And a lot of people are considering white label. And you know, it's I always tell people uh, selling a private label uh, partner program. It's 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 a wonderful thing to sell. Uh, I, I enjoy the wholesale community within telecommunications very much. Always have uh, in every in every aspect of that. Um, but it's it's a it's also very common that hey I talk to somebody and six months later maybe they come back around it, it's it's a it's a it's a program and a go to market strategy that does take time for you to digest it does take time for you to see if you're right for it and I think 
Um, the ones who take their time, you know, sometimes people just know right away, hey, I'm ready for this. I've thought about this for two or three years. I've thought about it for a month. I know that I can do this. My company's set up today to kind of do this. Uh, and then there's the other side of it where it's my company's not really set up today. I'm a one or two man shop. You know, should I be doing this? And you know, I'll be honest with you. And some, you know, once I understand, you know, the software that you're using and, you know, how you're going to market today and the types of, you know, solutions that you're selling today, I'll, I'll give you a yay or nay in terms of, uh, you know, what does that look like? Is that, does that make sense? Because UMA does have a great channel program as well. So that is something that we can lean on uh, and work your way up towards if that's, uh, if that makes sense. So, um, but thank you for the poll. And I'm just going to continue on here. Uh, so, and, and that goes back to, and are you ready for UMA private label? Um, so, you know, these are kind of the prerequisites for, of, of being a good private label partner. And as I see other, by the way, other questions pop up, I will be answering them uh, towards the end of the presentation. So uh, feel free to keep asking here. Um, but is UMA private label, uh, are, you, are you a good fit for that? So let's understand what a good fit is. Um, there is a small minimum requirement. I'm not going to be going any over any financials today. Uh, there has to be NDA, NDA signed so I can protect my partners. I don't want to, you know, uh, give out their wholesale pricing and what they're making to the whole community here. But um, it, the, the minimum is a very small minimum. It's a one-time minimum. Um, and I, I purposely put that minimum in there to, you know, incentivize people to get into this program. If they're going to get into it, then you should do it. If you're not, you know, interested in a, a small minimum, then obviously it maybe is not the right program for you and that's okay. Um, but, you know, can you handle level one support? Uh, so, you know, as I always tell, you know, even my channel partners, you're kind of the first line of defense because in a lot of cases, even through the channel, if something, you know, historically at any company I've been at ever went wrong, I would hear from the partners before I would hear even from my support team or customers. So, uh, but can you handle level one support? Um, of course, UMA is, is, is level two and three for our private label partners. Provisioning, implementations, building endpoints and call flow, uh, building hunk groups and auto attendance is that we, you know, we give you software to do this, but you, know, you are responsible for the actual execution of, of provisioning your customers. Hardware, there's a couple different ways to, uh, to go about this is that um, you can provide your own hardware and make your own revenue streams as long as it's our supported models and you know, we certainly uh, can go over that. Uh, or you know, we can provide the hardware uh, for your customers, pre-provision, drop ship, plug and play, ready to go. You know, as I always tell people, if you're not in the hardware business today and that's something you want to work your way up to, certainly happy to do that I could you know I, I could care less whether I sell hardware or not um, but as long as customers get what they need and they're they're satisfied with that and the provisioning is done um, but I have partners that do their own hardware they provision it and they send it out to the customers and I have partners who don't touch it at all so uh, it's a mixed bag there but open to either side of it and then you know can you handle your own billing uh, we provide a billing as a service solution. We have some great partners that we work with as well. Um, so, you know, if, if you're concerned about uh, providing billing, uh, don't let that stop you from at least having a conversation because it shouldn't. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, great things in software and partners that we can, you know, introduce you to and provide you, uh, you know, to mitigate that problem. So. And then do you really want to be your own service provider? And uh, I think that's a great question. I usually don't read slides verbatim, but it's kind of, it's, it makes sense to do it here. And it, that is a good point is that I do know some companies historically that would be great private label providers. They just don't want to do it. And if they don't want to do it, then they shouldn't do it. That's what I tell them. Because, <laughs> you know, like me, you know, we, we're, it's tough to, you know, to, to pivot your company and go to market for something that you don't want to do. It's hard enough to, to do that when you do want to do something. So, um, you know, really think about, you know, whether this is a good fit for you. If you're still unsure, schedule a call with me and I'm happy to walk you through and, you know, and have a nice conversation with you. Uh, some of the capabilities in terms of how do we enable partners to be self-sufficient, you know, and that is the key to being a great private label uh, service provider. It's also uh, absolutely um, huge to uh, your success as a private label partner is that if we don't enable you with the right software, then you're not going to be very successful. So, um, you know, from a provisioning standpoint, you know, there's a, a platform uh, we call it UMA Enterprise, and <clears throat> that is a completely rebrandable platform where it has your brand, your logo, and you can go in and start building all the endpoints and call flow. 
it's almost a drag it's drag and drop in terms of you know if you want to drag a user in you drag the user in if you want to drag voicemail in under that user if you want to drag you know some sort of uh, you know call routing or ring group under that then you can drag it so it's very very easy and very intuitive uh, and that was you know one of the most appealing things about uma and the product itself was you know this uma uh, enterprise platform you know that they have built uh, I should say, you know, actually purchase, but uh, it's it's an incredible platform uh, in terms of you know reteaching partners how to be self-sufficient and selling your brand. Uh, <clears throat> so you can provision customers at your own pace. Uh, you ha you don't have to rely on anybody. Um, it, it, once you get the hang of it, and we go through training. Uh, it's very very easy to use. You can also connect SIP trunks, uh, you know, within seconds. We're we're open to I think any PBX prem based PBX out there. And one thing that I do want to point out, I think something from an industry standpoint that's that's lacking that a lot of people cannot do, and if they can, they don't they don't discuss this with their partners or their customers, is you know when I was involved and been involved in enterprise deals, you know almost every time they're coming off a premise based solution looking to go to the cloud. Yeah, so if you look at a 20,000 seat company with you know, maybe 500 locations, you know, if we go back to them and say, fine, you have to migrate, you know, 20,000 users all at once at 500 locations, um, you, you, you'll get some eye roll in there. And I've certainly uh, at times, you know, lost deals because of that. Uh, depending on the types of technology, yes, you can do tiered migrations, but what happens to the remaining users on that prem? Uh, you know, system in terms of, you know, interoperable dial plans. And that's something that this platform can do, that you can have a thousand users on an Avaya system and a thousand users on UMA's, UMA Enterprise system, and they can forward to dial each other. We can get those two worlds to speak to each other. And I can't tell you the value that adds when you're in enterprise deals, but it's tremendous, right? So that what that does is it, it, it makes you know these enterprise you know the mentalities of hey we don't have to do this all at once we can ease ourselves out of this you know we can kind of test as we go you know, we can see what's working what's not working without you know putting our jobs on the line which is what they're all pretty much worried about and rightly so i would be too um so a great solution great technology that caters to both uh, the premise base and to uh, the hybrid slash cloud world as you're migrating people off so uh, it's what you know. One thing that I think that our partners are going to really start uh, going to be taking advantage of as well. So you know, how do we enable companies? Uh, you know, so from a, a, a quoting you know aspect and dictating your margins, right? Is that you know what a good private label program will do? Will you know provide you the ability to build your quotes all the way to billing your customer at the end and everything in between. So quoting, implementation, provisioning, right? And that's what our software enables you to do, right? So it's all one place. And in some aspects, not everybody needs all of our software. Maybe they have their own billing capabilities and whatnot. So great, you know, we can cater to that world as well. Um, so from a margin standpoint, you dictate how much money you make on every deal. We don't tell you that. So we say, here's your cost. And if you're going to sell a 25-seater, you know, this is maybe what you would sell it for. And this is historically what we have seen. Again, it's up to you, Mr. or Mrs. Partner, in terms of what you sell this for. Uh, and the other side of that would be, um, you know, if you're selling a thousand seat user, yeah, of course you're going to discount a little bit more, but you have a thousand seats, right? And uh, and it's about the aggregate number. So when you take those two examples and, and put them together, you know, what's your gross profit margin across the board there? Uh, and that's, you know, that's what white label and private label is really all about. It's that aggregate game of uh, building your own customer base that you can someday sell, uh, someday retire on, and someday obviously, um, you know, provide customers with the experience that, that, that you want at the timing that they want uh, and the features and the deliveries that they want. So it's, it's, it gives you much more control, you know, to track all your orders and look up your quotes and see what your sales folks are doing, understand the technology is that, you know, I think one issue, you know, that the channel, some, you know, channel partners sometimes have is that they have too many solutions under their belt. So understanding four or five of them can be difficult, right? I mean, when you really talk about, you know, getting into the provisioning side of any platform and I've sold, Genban, Microsoft, Cisco, Asterix, Broadsoft, every call control platform out there. You know, is one better than another than the other? No, not really. It's how you engineer them, 
uh, how you how you architect them, how you how you build the redundancy, and really the money you invest on the back end. And the software is what makes the interfaces easy to provision or not easy to provision. So that control is really uh, is important uh, of course from a billing anniversary standpoint you know con you know being able to uh, track all of your customers you know when they're paying you um you know deciding who's late and who's not is that you have full control over that world without having to wait for any of the service providers and we do have our own billing as a service platform. Um, uh, we use Blue Logics as our billing as a service platform. Uh, we also work with other providers, uh, third-party uh, partners, I should say, uh, that, that can help out uh, from a compliance standpoint. Um, so there's there's a lot of avenues that we can take uh, in terms of making sure that you have, um, you know, what you need to to get out to your customers, you know, from a billing standpoint. Um, you know, an anniversary date collections, you know, with all the automated messaging, uh, everything is built there for you to be successful. Uh, so, yeah, you can leverage our service platform, billing as a service platform, you can use your own. Um, and that's some of the things in terms of, you know, what 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 is the next big, you know, concern for, <laughs> for private label partners? And of course, the, you know, the ugly five letter word taxes, right? Is that that is just... You know, one word that I've heard time and time again throughout this industry, and for, you know, it, it is, it, let's be honest, telecom taxes are not the easiest thing to figure out. So um, what UMA does is, you know, we we handle the taxes on behalf of our white label partners. So we have a tax engine built in to our quoting platform that will literally take care of that on behalf of the white label partners. You'll send them out. Um, when you build a quote, those tax will be will be fed into the quote, and then that can be remitted back to the you know FCC for you know when you file your taxes at the end of the quarter or the end of the year in terms of how you handle that. So um, you know we remit that back. You know we handle the taxes, and I can tell you I don't know of another private label provider who does that. Not to say none do, I just don't know of any. Um, that is a huge win and something that I've lost a lot of private label partners for in the past because it is complicated. Is that you know there is certain aspects of that uh, you know that that scare people and rightly so. So now um, there is a difference between a gray label and a white label partner when you talk about uh, UMA and uh, and a gray label partner basically handles their own taxation, handles their own billing. They're not leveraging UMA software to do that, whereas a white label partner is handling is leveraging. Uh, UMA's uh, taxation and, and, and billing as a service. So uh, certainly have options there uh, again, uh, but we have you covered, right? And you don't have to worry about, you know, wearing a striped suit and ending up in jail. It's not gonna happen, you know, with us is that, you know, we have a lot of successful partners uh, and this certainly eases their mind once they see how this is done. So, you know, kudos to, uh, to UMA for getting that done. And again, I kind of just mentioned this, but I'll, for the visual, I'll leave it up there. Um, whereas, you know, White Label, we're providing you with everything to, uh, to to build a quote, turn that quote into a customer, you know, and then track that order until it gets to a, a billing stage, right? And that's all through UMA, you know, software that we're providing you. Whereas a great label partner, maybe you're going to take, you know, our costs and our catalog and upload that into your um, <clears throat> into your uh, you know, quoting engine or billing engine uh, to handle that on your own. There isn't a right or wrong way, right? So I'm, it's very difficult for me to go to a company and say, yeah, stop using your billing engine that you've been using for 10 years, five years, and use ours. Why? There's no reason to do that. So if it's as simple as just uploading costs in there, uh, then it's, it really is, it makes life uh, pretty easy for the partners. And then, of course, if they're going to leverage our solution, uh, then why not do that? And this is just a visual representation, as I answered this before, uh, in terms of, um, you know, our international locations for our data centers and our, of course, the ones that are located in the States here. Uh, we're based out of California, so this isn't too far from our office, you know, right here in uh, Sunnyvale. Uh, we bought a company by the name of Voxter, which is the UMA Enterprise private label platform. Uh, and you know that company we bought, we kept the employees. They're based out of Vancouver, and I went there for the first time to before COVID-19 hit. And um, uh, great city, great people up there. Um, really, you know, customer focused and partner focused uh, in terms of you know the deliverables and making sure um, they provide a, a really sound solution. One in Chicago and one in Toronto for the East Coast side. And then we have one in London, Tokyo, uh, Japan, and of course Melbourne, Australia. So. Don't push away your international customers. 
Yeah, when I say that, yeah, international is the next big thing I think in UCAS, and I've been having international conversations for years. You know, just some of the previous companies I worked at, they couldn't hit the mark. Uh, they couldn't deliver locally in those countries. They didn't have you know data centers set up there. Um, but they, it seems that you know a lot of the companies in 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 UK, specifically the ones that I talked to, are looking for. U.S. based products that they can deliver within UK. I guess the the products over there, from what I heard, are maybe not as strong, or they don't like them as much. I, I don't know for sure quite why that is, but that's the general feedback. And I've had probably 50, 60 conversations over the last five years, you know, three years maybe it is, um, you know, talking to these international types of partners and you know why they're looking to use a U.S. based company to deliver service, you know, within the UK. But it, it's going to blow up at some point. You want to be with the right provider. You know that thought ahead and invested correctly. You know if you're, you know if you're talking to a company that, you know they have international customers and they say, hey, great, we can do that and we'll spin up a data center for you, no problem. It's you don't want to go that route, right? You want to make sure it's already established because spinning up data centers and 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 connectivity in other countries isn't as easy as they probably make it sound. So uh, we've we're established, we've done this, we have presence there. We, you know, it's something that uh, we invested in, so uh, we're ready to do this to, today. And then back to the SIP hybrid migration. Um, this is another game changer that people just, I think, overlook within the industry is don't push those customers away either. It doesn't have to be all prem and all cloud today, right? Was that let's understand what the customer wants. Let's understand, and this is for channel partners, this is for private label partners, whatever it might be, is you know, this is a another big you know uh, part in our industry that I think that, get, that gets overlooked because maybe some providers don't cater to this world very well. Their technology doesn't play very well. Is that, yes, they can do it, but uh, you know, it's not something they've ever done. This is stuff that we do regularly. So uh, easy migration for prem users, which means it's a slow migration for prem users, right? We can integrate with any prem system. And if you look at our software, if I do the demo for you, if we set up calls, I'll show you the part where it says SIP and it just has every prem-based PBX. Uh, you know, that's pretty much ever been built uh, that we integrate to. Um, and then, you know, the interoperable dialing plans on the back end. So an Avaya system can four digit dial an UMA cloud system. That's key, right? Is that you don't want to change their day to day and how they're using and how they're used to using the phone system. Um, you know, if, I mean, we've all been on calls with people who are even transitioning off key systems. It's like, I want to be able to pick up the phone, put them on hold. You know, it's like not a parking lot, but a key system hold, right? So, you know, these are the types of things that, you know, little things that people get caught up on, but it can cause you from winning business. And it's it's kind of infuriating when you go through a sales process and, you know, uh, a, a simple hold versus park is, is really, you know, the common denominator of pushing you out versus another provider. So, you know, we think of those types of things when we're, you know, building these types of uh, architectures and solutions is that, you know, where where's the market not touching? You know, what what part of, you know, of our software, uh, you know, could we be different in, in terms of providing solutions that maybe people have had to say no to in the past? So really important stuff there. <laughs> the types of supported hardware are the Mitel Astro phones. Um, Yay Links, you know, I would say Yay Links are, you know, pretty much dominating the world right now. Um, uh, Third-party SIP devices, it really depends on what it is. So, you know, I would say a, a blanketed, you know, question that I always get is, um, you know, I have an Avaya system, can I use this on cloud? No, right? I would never use Prem handsets on a cloud solution. I don't care what prem or cloud solution it is, is that it's two completely different languages. Uh, maybe you get it to work, maybe you don't, but you're going to have a tough experience, right? It's not worth the pain of just buying new phones, especially with all the soft phones and mobility that's out there. Um, you know, you have, you know, uh, so many different ways to, you know, get inbound, outbound calls. And, and I think from this COVID-19, uh, you know, situation that we're all in, you know, one of the silver linings, if there, you know, if there really is one, is that the remote workforce is now pushing people to use applications, to use mobility applications instead of using physical hardware. Where people, you know, why why do people continue to use hardware? Because they're tied to it, because they're used to using it. When they walk in their office, they want that feeling of a physical handset right there. But is it needed? No, it's not. Um, so yeah, I don't like to sell people out of using something that they've been using for 15, 20, 30 years. I'm fine. If you want me to sell you another phone, great, I'll do it. But just understand the world is going this way. 
Uh, and in, in situations like this, as bad as they are, speed those kind of escalations up, right? Now it's forcing people to use mobility, to use unified communications, video conferencing, right? So, um, it, you know, so we have to take, <clears throat> you know, uh, where we can see, you know, these types of scenarios changing and, and really say, hey, you know, remember COVID-19 you know, and this is behind us in a month or so. Um, you know, remember when this happened and we had to scramble to get re you know, remote workforces and you had to scramble to get cloud communications and, you know, replace your prem because, you know, you have all of a sudden you had a 500 people that were in an office, you know, 400 of them are now working at home remotely individually. It's hard to set that many people up at once. I mean, it must be really scary for some of these companies. So, you know, now, you know, our, I think all of our sales pitches, you know, for cloud salespeople are, are changing, right? Is that, you know, it's not as much, you know, disaster recovery features are there, sure. But think about the future. Think about not just the next pandemic, but think about how the work world has changed from this pandemic. And, you know, what is it going to look like coming out of this? And are you set up correctly? Typical customers, what do they look like? You know, I always struggle with this at any company I've ever worked at is that who doesn't need a phone system? Who doesn't need phones? So uh, very few companies in this world don't need phones, right? Maybe some don't need a lot of it. Some don't use them a lot, but they generally usually need phones. So um, with that said, we we have been very successful in um, the restaurant chains and to the residential, I shouldn't say resident, I'm sorry, restaurant and broker agents, maybe real estate brokers, um, tech firms, uh, financial industries. Yeah, that's where we've seen a lot of success. Um, so, <clears throat> but it's not it's to the point where that's all that we sell is that we have all types of customers like many other uh, providers out there is that uh, a lot of companies say that they're vertical specific service providers say they're vertical specific but they're not right they they pick one or two wins and say okay this is our vertical um and, and rightly so is that because it, it, so many different people need phones so uh we do like to you know to focus on the hospitality industry we do that very well uh it's something that we you know we've actually been been experts in for years uh but that doesn't mean again that's all that we're selling to yeah so also you know for types of customers that are looking to have more control over their phone this phone system not just from the private label standpoint but think of yourself as a private label provider now selling to admins of bigger companies is that they want control of their own you know their own phone system and uma enterprise gives unlimited access to you know to, to change call uh, call routing, add users, delete users is endless. The things that admins can do. Now you can restrict this, and in, in terms of defining that, making sure that you don't give too much access. But you know, if you have admins that they know what they're doing and they want full access, you know, for these enterprise types of solutions, Uma Enterprise is the perfect solution for that. Uh, is that they can literally build a whole new phone system if they want to in another location themselves. It's it's that intuitive. So again, it's just how you know how much access do you want to give them? CRM integrations, office suites, Dynamics, Salesforce, you know, we have an open API library to the public that can pretty much write code to any type of third-party software application that you would need. So we're, we're very, very, very open because this is an open source platform. We own all the technology. We're not a, a broad soft provider or a meta switch provider. We don't, we're not, you know, at the mercy of somebody else that owns, you know, the licensing aspect of it. So we don't have to ask permission. We just have a bunch of engineers in Vancouver, uh, developers in Vancouver and, and also Sunnyvale that can, you know, just get to work and write this type of code and have done so time and time again. Uh, and then you can combine those international and domestic locations, which, you know, I think is a, a huge win for uh, those, you know, people that are looking to, you know, get those larger type of customers, uh, you know, that are across multiple countries. Great support enablement, um, again, for Uma Enterprise based out of uh, Vancouver. Um, it, you're going to get a live person every time. We're not outsourcing you to another country. Everything is in-house. I mean, I guess Canada is really considered another country, but it's that's where the company's based out of uh, for uh, Uma Enterprise, right? So um, it, that's where the support, the provisioning team is. Um, you know, marketing. Uh, there's some aspects out of there as well. Um, I'm in, based in Philadelphia. You know, I'm in sales, so we're a little bit spread out there. Um, but for the most part, you know, you have a, a large team uh, of people within the Vancouver office that are going to help our private label partners get certified, trained. 
um, understand how to do all the provisioning in the software, get them set up, you know, within the private label billing uh, software if they're going to leverage that, uh, and and also, you know, the the post training dedicated team to making sure that you know they they understand you know with what they went through with training that uh, they're going to be successful in implementing their customers. So uh, in terms of thank you again everybody for you know hopping on and attending. Um, in terms of understanding what the next steps are, it, there's a very specific sales process for private label. Um, people always want to jump to pricing. I can already hear what's your pricing, what's your pricing. Uh, I, you know that's and I would be asking that too. I don't blame you. Um, there's more important things before pricing. Is this one a good fit? Um, I'd like to schedule a call with you. You know, and just bring you through that process. Basically, call once, discovery. You're learning a little bit about us. I'm learning a little bit about you. Two is a software demo. If you don't like the software, and the, or it's too too much for you to do, it's not going to be. The pricing is is it doesn't matter at that point. So yeah, you have to like the software. The software is you know going to be your day to day. The people that are in the day to day for your business, building, you know, provisioning, implementing, delivering, right? Is that that has to resonate with them as well? And then you know, call three would be a pricing overview. We go over your costs. We go over. We sign an NDA. Um, we go over your margins. We do some deal examples. I assume that you're selling for this. You say, well, nope, maybe I'm selling for this, so we can get through margins, you know, and what that looks like. Um, but it's take advantage of the process. It's 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 not meant to sell you something. It's meant to educate you. It really is. So, uh, and then after that, it's really about you know you know if everything goes well, you know, contract and then training timelines to make sure that we have the right audience. And uh, here's my contact information. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out morning, noon, or night. Um, you know, obviously I'm not going anywhere these days, so uh, we are working quite a bit. Um, and uh, we really look forward to having these types of conversations with you. I can see some questions have popped up here, and I'll uh, and I'll try and kind of go at, uh, answer these one by one. Um, but uh, let me hand it back to uh, TMC Net and uh, uh, and I'll just take a look at these questions and start digesting these. Thank you very much again, TMC and everybody for hopping on. You guys do a great job. Um, you know, we really look forward to uh, you know to working with everybody here. Awesome. Thank you, Brad. Um, you know, while you uh, digest some of those questions that have, have already been coming in, just a, qu a couple quick notes for our audience. Um, for those of you who have questions and haven't gotten them to us, uh, now's the time to make sure you do that. Uh, we do have a whole bunch coming in. Uh, if there are any that we don't get to live during the event, uh, I know that Brad and the team over at UMO will answer any additional questions offline following today's event. And if you have additional questions that come up uh, once we're through today, contact information, you've got Brad's information in front of you. Um, if you forget to jot it down, uh, follow-up email that includes contact information as well as details on accessing the on-demand version of today's event will be sent to you tomorrow so you'll have uh, all that stuff for you um you know with that brad let's let's get to some of these questions yeah absolutely so i think i answered uh are reseller programs available for other countries the answer is yes it is um absolutely uh and i'll try and get through these as quick as possible i can elaborate on these if we, if we want to connect after uh, can white label be sold through two levels i.e can your reseller act as a reseller to a third party yes so if you you can have resellers under you uh, but you can't resell our white label as a white label solution. So if you have agents under you, um, absolutely, you can build your own agent community um, under there in terms of reselling our white label solution. That's that's for us to do. Um, does your platform have a global presence or U.S.? Yes, it does. We went over uh, U.S., uh, Canada, um, U.K., Australia, and Japan. Okay, next question, does UMA handle tax remittance for the white label partner? Yes, if you're an actual white label partner, um, the answer would be yes on that, we would. Uh, does your billing system provide payments to your sub-agents? Yes, you can set up sub-agents uh, to be, because uh, we do have a channel program, we pay sub-agents through it, so absolutely it can be, uh, it's not a problem. Um, where are we here? Okay, here we go. Can we get a record uh, copy of this presentation? Absolutely. I'll, uh, uh, they'll be sending that out, sounds like, tomorrow. How about existing Ring Central customers with RC co-branded Cisco phones? Can they keep their phones for UMA service? 
Um, depends on the, the type of Cisco phones that they're using. It's not a phone that we advertise as supporting, but um, send me the types of models that they have and I'll take a look at it. I know that we do, we have supported Cisco phones in the past. I can't remember if it was the Spa or the 79 series, but uh, send me the models. I'm happy to take a look with my engineer uh, and, and, and see if that's something that we can do. And I will be honest, if they lose features and it's not a good experience, I say no to those. Just be, you know, some people will say yes, hey, it's fine, but you're gonna lose 50% of the features and the customer's gonna be really upset. Well, that's a no in my book. So um, if it's not 100%, then it's a no. Um, I accidentally si uh, signed in late. Will you be setting out the webinar? Yes, we will be. Uh, where will I find uh, an on-demand version tomorrow? Yep, so got a lot of lot of people watching the reruns here, which is great. Is your API RESTful? Not sure what that means. So, um, Jerry, I will I will get back to you on that. That sounds like a great question and one that's above my head. presentation files. all right looks like everything oh uh, do you also offer FMC uh, I'm not sure what that is either I'm sure it'll come back to me in a second but um, uh, Francesca I will send that answer to you um, if you want to shoot me an email uh, I can uh, certainly um, you know run that up the line there fixed mobile conversions yes it does so absolutely Awesome, Brad. And for those folks who are looking for the presentation, um, you should be able to download it uh, under the handouts section of the attendee interface um, for those of you who are interested. Um, and you're very welcome, Francesca. Thank you very much for elaborating. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting talking to you as you're chatting, but I really appreciate it and hope to talk to you at some point. So thank you. Um, and then that's that seems to be all the questions here. So just in the nick of time, I thought I was going to be done a lot quicker. So sometimes I ramble on a lot. So I appreciate everybody letting me ramble on. Stay safe out there. And I look forward to catching up with you uh, at some point over the next uh, week or so. And should we